And uh, now we turn to questions from the subcommittee members, and we begin with the gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, Mr. Genzer, I'm not starting with you just because your daughter goes to UW-Madison, but I do have a question that I think you uh, 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 would be great to answer. Um, I, I've been telling and sharing with my fellow committee members about uh, how I spent my spring recess, which included uh, an energy tour of my home state and meeting with innovators and, uh, and renewable uh, energy producers. Um, one of the sites that I had the chance to visit was um, uh, Johnson Controls. Johnson Controls does a wide range of things, but they have uh, a building energy efficiency uh, segment of their business. And in fact, we had uh, a representative of Johnson Controls uh, testify a few months back before our, our subcommittee. Just a couple of weeks ago, the company announced that they would be involved in retrofitting the Empire State Building. Uh, using innovative uh, processes and state-of-the-art tools that should uh, help reduce the building's energy consumption by uh, pretty impressive 38 percent per year with technologies that will pay off in a two-year time frame. That would probably place it, I think, in the top 10 percent of all U.S. office buildings in terms of the use of, of or in terms of energy efficiency. But one of the things I found interesting in my discussions with uh, employees at Johnson Controls um, was an interesting conundrum. Because many of the commercial buildings turn over ownership um, so often, sometimes as rapidly as every three years or so, um, the incentive of, of owners to make energy efficiency improvements and investments um, often just don't exist. Uh, and so I would love to hear your thoughts about how um, we on this panel could incentivize this sort of energy efficiency improvement in some of these buildings. I've been tossing around a few um, ideas of my own, uh, but I'd love to hear yours uh, uh, right now. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, um, the whole energy service performance contracting programs that Johnson Controls is really one of the leaders in is a great model. In fact, um, a lot of the funds that, are, that came through the stimulus package targeted to the state energy program, what we're seeing in a lot of the states is that, that a lot of those funds are being targeted to energy service performance contracts. So that's one of the, uh, one of the real uh, preeminent examples, uh, and we can certainly give you more information on a state-by-state -state basis as that moves forward. In terms of incentives for commercial building owners where um, the, they need payback periods in a shorter period of time, one of the elements of the bill, of the draft bill now, the retrofit for energy and environmental performance program that's in the bill, uh, I think Representative Welch uh, is the chief sponsor of that, included uh, targets for commercial buildings on a per square foot basis for extra incentives. So we think that's a great idea. Uh, it's one of the steps. There's also uh, additional things that could be done in terms of energy service performance contracts. We're trying to do a lot more at the state level on that and um, extension of the commercial building uh, energy efficiency uh, tax deduction is another one that would be helpful. Uh, we're spending a lot of time working with commercial building owners on a state-by-state -state basis uh, to try to see if there's additional incentive. So uh, we certainly work with them. It's a great idea. And also, I think Mr. Gardner might have a comment about the tie-in with the energy efficiency resource standard. Absolutely. And I actually have another question and time limit. So if you want to make a quick comment, Mr. Gardner, and then I have a... Just that, as I said in my opening statement, that, the, that under an energy efficiency resource standard, what happens is that utility companies offer rebates, including to commercial building owners, to do this. And so it takes away the problem that you identify, which is one of the serious barriers to energy right. efficiency, which is the builder or the landlord isn't necessarily the person who's responsible for paying the energy bill, may not own the building for a long period of time. So the, the rebates that utility companies offer under the uh, provisions in the draft discussion uh, 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 under the energy efficiency resource standard are, I think, a critical incentive. Let me jump in quickly with my, my uh, second question, and I, I'm very supportive of the EERS and the bill. Um, based on information I've received from my constituency, I feel like um, Wisconsin is well suited to uh, comply with the EERS um, through at least 2012. However, I do have a question. Uh, 
One of the things we talk about in another section of the bill is the potential for widespread deployment of electric vehicles over the next uh, 15 or more years. Um, and if we see this widespread deployment, uh, the base quantities for retail, retail electricity distributors could grow quite rapidly. And thus, the amount of electricity savings that they will be required to see, um, achieve could grow rapidly could kind of potentially transform the EERS savings required, making them a little bit more challenging to meet um, and, and expensive to meet. And I'm wondering if this is the intent, and if not, is there anything we should be looking at um, it modifying in anticipation of the potential of, of widespread deployment of um, electric vehicles? Um, the Energy Information Administration says today that actually, if you look out towards the future, that the amount of electricity that uh, vehicles like that might consume is still projected to be relatively small. Uh, that could, of course, change in the way that uh, you suggest, and we'd think that was a good idea. So I think that uh, there could be some provision that would allow the Secretary of Energy, for example, to modify that if uh, he or she saw that uh, the amount of electric vehicles were consuming a large amount of energy. But I think at the moment it looks like it's a relatively uh, small problem, at least through uh, 2020, uh, uh, but it's but it's an, it, it is an issue, and I, I think uh, it's certainly worthy of further discussion to look at. If I could just make a a quick comment, is um, our blueprint included a significant ramp up in plug-in hybrids to reaching 20 percent of sales by 2030. So very expecting very aggressive progress on that technology, and under our blueprint, uh, when you invest in efficiency and when you invest in renewable electricity the grid can handle it. And frankly, I would love to have the problem where we have too many plug-ins on the road. That, that is a problem I look forward to having someday. Great. Uh, General Lady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, too, sadly, will have to leave you with the last panel on your own, I'm afraid. I regret to say. Uh, I do want to put, before I start, I want to uh, put into the record a, a letter from the International Code Council addressed to yourself, uh, with Chairman Waxman, Barton, and myself. We'll include it in the record consent. without objection. And I want to focus just a, a little bit on autos uh, before I get in my auto and, and depart. Uh, Mr. McCurdy and, and uh, Mr. Ruther are good friends of mine, too. Appreciate all the work you've done for our state as we try to have the auto industry uh, survive. Uh, Mr. McCurdy, you t talk a lot about the, having a single standard. And of course, that is in the bill, but the standard is California. And the way that I read it, it allows them to, in fact, change the standard. And when they change it, that is California, so does the rest of the nation then follow their lead. Is that your understanding of the way that it's in the draft as well? Uh, Mr. Epton, and thank you for your comments earlier, too, and uh, I very much appreciate working with you, and I have for a number of years. Uh, section 221, I believe, is uh, the section you're referring to in sub 4. And that, uh, I think the, the, the draft uh, made a, an effort to address uh, at least three of the, the concerns in the first three sections uh, about the standard. Uh, the fourth <coughs> section, I think Mr. Ruth and I both would concur uh, needs work, and that's the area that uh, we uh, would like to see the committee continue conversations. Uh, I think the Obama administration has an opportunity uh, to create a single national approach uh, that would be administered by the federal government uh, so that we eliminate the duplicative uh, and potentially uh, conflicting standards. The reason there are concerns, it's not just a, a question of stringency. The structure is the, one of the major challenges of compliance, enforcement, uh, and uh, several other provisions. And, and that has to be harmonized. And I think the administration is going to uh, try to address that. <clears throat> and I think they're going to have to work with Congress uh, as well. So again, I, you know, we do strongly support a single national standard. Uh, one comment that um, uh, my friend, Mr. Ruther, made with regard to future. Uh, it's clear that under the uh, ISA, the Energy Bill 2007, which we supported, uh, and the, the, the CAFE provisions, that uh, we can see our way to 2016. Uh, beyond that, though, 
is an area of, of major concern. It's a concern because of the need for clarity and predictability because of the need to ramp up to produce the kinds of technologies. Uh, Mr. Friedman mentioned 20 percent uh, plug-in hybrids by 2030. That's a, an extremely aggressive number. Uh, we'd like to be there, but uh, I'm not sure that's without proper incentives, without a real energy policy that incentivizes consumers, uh, there's certainly no guarantee that that will occur. So uh, we need, um, we, there's not one single uh, silver bullet technology, but it's clear we need certainty and predictability. And I think that section is one that on a bipartisan basis that we should address and look forward to working with you on it. And Mr. Ruther, do you want to comment on that at all? We read the draft bill a little bit differently. It, it, to us, it appears to say through 2015 there would be a harmonized standard, but after that point in time, nothing is clear except there's a green light to California to go ahead. And as I indicated in, in the testimony, uh, we would like to see uh, longer-term harmonization and certainty, both for the environmental fuel savings benefits, but also uh, because it will assist the companies in knowing uh, what is required of them, where they have to put their emphasis in terms of investments and in technology. Now, both of you talked about substantial investment to be able to get to that point. I presume that that comes from, as you said, Mr. McCurdy, a 5 percent uh, uh, of the allocation. Uh, I would presume then that if the Obama administration's request of a 100 percent auction therefore leaving nothing to be uh, taken out of that for allocations, you all would be opposed to the bill? Is that right? Well, I said either allocations or revenue. So oh. it's a question. <laughs> and I think slope. that section in the bill is not clear. Uh, we were not certain. I'm sure it's something the committee is going to be working on. But uh, the point I hope is clear, and that is if uh, we're going to be held uh, accountable or responsible for EPA's number of 17 percent of the emissions, uh, and we understand the incredible costs associated with uh, addressing that, that there should be uh, dedicated revenues or allocations uh, for the investments that are needed for research and development, production, retooling, uh, which is going to be quite substantial. Yeah. Just in closing, I know my time has expired. Uh, I was glad to hear you talk about the clunkers uh, bill uh, scrappage. I think that's very important to get the consumers uh, back into the showroom and send the green light uh, to all of our auto workers, uh, whether they be suppliers or assembly folks. Uh, uh, it's key, and I'm glad that we have bipartisan support led by our colleague uh, Betty Sutton from our committee and Candace Miller from Michigan, which I'm a co-sponsor. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. We uh, recognize another sponsor of the Cash for Clunkers legislation, Mr. Inslee, uh, for uh, questioning. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McCurdy, uh, some of us have been looking at uh, the Project Better Place model of trying to improve infrastructure for charging and swapping out batteries. Uh, could you give us your group's thoughts about it? How do we make that work? Well, how can we do? We do have a provision in the bill that will help development of infrastructure. Just appreciate your comments on that. Thank you, Mr. And I, and I don't mean to limit my comments to Project Better Place. There are other companies involved no, in this as exactly well. Exactly right. Um, it's good to, to see you, and I appreciate uh, your support. As I s indicated in, in my written statement, that fuels and autos are a system, and uh, for the past uh, few decades, I think the focus has been on the autos and not as much on fuels or the system. If we move to the electrification of vehicles, whether it's, uh, in, and again, there are a number of business models out there. Uh, we can't comment on which one is more most likely to succeed, but it's clear the infrastructure has to be there, and you have to move now in order to uh, pave the way for whether it's plug-ins, um, uh, fully electric vehicles, uh, whether it's, uh, and, and that's where the smart grid comes in. It's also where uh, utilities, I think, uh, are going to be incentivized to, to address that as well. What you need is uh, the ability to, to recharge, whether it's home through a smart grid at night when the rates are lower, uh, or your place of work, or if you're uh, uh, moving around uh, urban environments. 
uh, and it's clear the current infrastructure is not there to support that. So uh, this is an important investment. A better place that you mentioned is uh, one where they have a, a different business model, but they want to have charging, fast charging, or replace the batteries themselves. Uh, again, we, we're not going to down-select uh, one particular technology, but we think the infrastructure could be supportive of, of the entire electrification process. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I wanted to ask Mr. Sperling and Mr. Drevna uh, the discussion about the low carbon fuel standard. Um, Mr. Drevna, uh, and I missed your oral testimony, I'm sorry, but I was just reading your testimony, and you were making reference that you thought that there was a possibility that the approach in the bill would discriminate against certain petroleum products. I think you were referring to Canadian tar sands. And I, I, I don't understand that criticism. Basically, uh, the bill would, it, it would have, quote, some discrimination, but it's based on carbon content. All the creator's children would be treated the same. It's just dependent on how much carbon content is in each fuel source. So I don't consider the bill discriminatory in that sense. It simply judges each system based on its carbon content. Perhaps Mr. Drevna and Mr. Sperling could comment on that. Well, I, I could. Thank you, uh, Mr. Minister. I would comment on. Unfortunately, Mr. Sperling had to uh, had to uh, catch I, an airplane. I, I, Mr. Friedman might be able to help us. Yeah. But oh, no, it was on. Uh, the, the question about the low carbon fuel standard is it's, it's what you're saying is there's, there's two parts to it that, that, that we see. One is that the, the bill, it's, the draft itself, has a, a, a cap, a cap and trade mechanism. And, you, and, and the bill also contains a low carbon fuel standard. We view those, those two things as both, as, as I said in my oral testimony, at best duplicative and redundant, and at worst as punitive and counterproductive. The, we have no control over uh, the, the, the only way to get low carbon fuel standard is to, is to blend non-carbon fuels into, the, uh, in, into gasoline or diesel. We have no control over the technology of advancing those, those, you know, those new fuels. We have no control over the infrastructure. If you have a cap, that's a performance standard. You're, and then you're saying you have to do more, do a low carbon fuel standard. And then when you look at the renewable fuel standard that we're still obligated under EPACT 05 and then ESA, as amended by ESA 07, we've got three potentially competing kinds of, of uh, legislation and regulation we have to look at. I think there's a, there's a misconception um, among a lot of folks um, that and I know that and I know you I know the uh, the draft says well we're gonna we're gonna phase out the RFS as we as we ramp up the LCFS. In theory, that sounds that sounds marvelous. In practicality, what it, it, it's 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 a, it's very difficult for refiners to do so. We we don't have a magic switch that we flip one day and say okay we're gonna now we're now we're out of the RFS and we're into the L, LCFS. It's, it's almost like, like the proponents believe that, you know, that there's two dimmer switches. One, one we're going to raise as, 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 uh, as, uh, on, the, on the LCFS while we lower the, car, the RFS. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Inslee, it simply doesn't work that way. And again, I go back to saying if you have a, if you have a, if you have a cap, if you have a performance standard, you know, it's one thing to have a belt and suspenders, you know, but these two are competing. They could, they could potentially be competing because there are many studies out there right now that suggest that a low carbon fuel standard is actually more energy intensive than other ways of reducing carbon. And I'll be more than happy. I don't want to use up all your time. I'll be more than happy. I appreciate happy. that. I think you came up with three criticisms I hadn't even heard yet. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, and again, I'll be more than happy to discuss these. But this is why I suggested that, that you know, we, we, would, we would suggest whether a, a, another hearing on this for, for the transportation sector. We heard a lot this morning about, the, about a lot of things involving electricity. Uh, we really, you know, from my parochial interest, and, and I shouldn't even say parochial, this is, this is, this is a, a nation's interest. From our interests, we, we have to fully understand what the impact's gonna be on transportation fuels because as we all know, this is what drives the economy. I appreciate it, Mr. 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 Friedman. Um, thank you, Congressman, and thank you very much for your leadership on the low carbon fuel standard. You've been very important to, to making progress in this area. Um, I think part of what we're seeing is when, when people don't want to make progress, they try to make things sound a lot more complicated than they really are. Um, the low carbon fuel standard is a very straightforward policy that creates a market for cleaner fuels. 
And one of the problems, one of the challenges with a cap and trade system is if we do it right, if we add in the complementary policies, sure, we'll maybe increase gasoline prices 15, 20 cents a gallon. Well, it took a near quadrupling of gas prices last summer to get significant change out of consumers. 15 or 20 cents a gallon is not going to stimulate low carbon biofuels. It is not going to stimulate electric vehicles. It is not going to stimulate fuel cell vehicles. A low carbon fuel standard will do just that. Also, it's not just about um, alternative fuels. Refineries have the potential to increase efficiency 10 to 20 percent. We've got a well, wellspring of efficiency improvements that can be seen throughout the economy, and refineries are part of that. So there's a lot of potential. This is really a lot, uh, a lot simpler than I think uh, people uh, make it seem. It, it's really the same case with vehicle standards. Once EPA sets strong enough standards, California has already made clear they will cede to EPA's authority yeah. when they set strong standards. Thank you. I'm over my time. I just want to make one closing comment. Throughout these discussions, one of the things we're trying to do is, is really promote the creation of new technology. We have to have new technologies here. And even if we could do certain things at zero cost today that don't get us to the ultimate goal, we've got to create these new technologies. I think this helps. Mr. Dillon, I, I, my time's kind of up. I look forward to talking to you some more. Thank you. Great. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. I'd like to uh, continue on a little bit with the um, subject that Congressman Inslee was discussing, and that is uh, fuel economy san standards and the automotive uh, sector, and, uh, and ask if I could, Mr. Ruther and Mr. McCurdy and Mr. Friedman, if we could just have a, a, a little discussion about the 2007 uh, fuel economy standard. Uh, 35 miles per gallon for the fleet by 2020, combined with the $25 billion in the uh, uh, green car factory funds, uh, combined with the $2 billion for the, um, for the battery uh, fund that uh, has been created in the stimulus. And just give me some sense of your optimism about how we just might re reach a tipping point in three, four, five years, uh, where uh, we move much more rapidly than even the law requires uh, because of the adoption of these uh, green car um, uh, new technologies that uh, will be manufactured by every company, not only in the United States but around the world. Uh, Mr. McCurdy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we obviously. Um, uh, applaud the uh, efforts to dedicate some revenue uh, or some funds after uh, the passage of ISA, $25 billion, Section 136 funds. As we know, that was over a year ago. Those funds are just now, the, the loans are just now starting to be made available. The battery money is uh, important. Uh, you have a particularly strong interest uh, in those technologies. Um, that's a step a small step in the right direction. If you recall, uh, the, the NHTSA estimates for the cost to the U.S. sector for compliance with uh, CAFE was going to be roughly $85 billion. So 25 is a down payment. I think it's an important step. But if you want to accelerate that, which is really uh, where you'd like to go, it's going to take a considerable more investment. Uh, and it's not just a question of money. I mean, it, uh, with all due respect to Mr. Friedman, it's, it's not as easy as perhaps some would say in theory. I mean, you actually have to do, uh, go beyond the laboratory and get it deployed. And in the manufacturing world, and when you're dealing with consumers, the real key is being able to have it where it's a warrantable product that will last, whether it's in the uh, rather cold uh, climate of Wisconsin in the winter or the summers in Arizona. And so batteries, uh, that's a big challenge to, to, to battery and electrification. But having said that, we're very optimistic uh, and uh, hopeful about uh, transformation to the new technologies, uh, and we want to work with uh, Congress and administration in order to make that happen. Thank you. Mr. Ruther. We believe that uh, the 2007 law was a very good law, and we're optimistic that the companies will be able to meet the standard in that law and, and perhaps do even better than that. Uh, 
it's my understanding that already enough applications have been submitted uh, to exceed the $25 billion that's already been appropriated for the Section 136 program, uh, and that's part of why we believe that uh, there's a need to provide additional funding going forward. Um, I also have to underscore, though, that uh, the ability of the companies to achieve better results in the future is being impacted by the current uh, severe recession in the industry, uh, which is severely straining the, the financial resources of the companies. Uh, it's also changing the underlying assumptions. I mean, one of the key assumptions that goes into the cost-benefit analyses is the number of vehicle sales. That affects the reductions that you get in emissions. It affects the cost of diffusing the technology across the entire fleet. So I, I think everyone is going to have to go back uh, and revisit uh, the calculations on what can be achievable going forward, given the dramatic change that we're seeing in the nature of the auto market. As the, um, as the auto marketplace once again goes from 10 million cars a year back up to 16 or 17 million cars per year, which are sold in the United States, um, and, and I do subscribe to Vice President Gore's analysis that as we recover and as the Chinese and Indian economies and other developing countries' economies continue to expand, uh, we will see an inexorable rise in the price of gasoline uh, here in the United States. Um, do, you, do you think that it's likely that the automotive industry will plan now that they have this much lower demand for that 16 or 17 million vehicle world that will be recreated in three or four years, hopefully, um, in a way that has a higher percentage of vehicles uh, coming from this energy efficient or a, a plug-in <coughs> hybrid or, or, or um, a straight hybrid vehicles, Mr. Ruther? Well, I think a lot of analysts are questioning whether we will be getting back to the 16, 17 million vehicle uh, sales level, um, that there may have been a long-term change in the overall demand. So I think that's an imp important thing. We do agree that over time the gas prices are going to be going to higher, higher levels. And uh, I mean, we believe there's a need for the government to try and incentivize and drive uh, the electrification of the industry and to drive that process as quickly as possible. And, and we want to work with you to be supportive of that. Right. Well, my, I'm just working from my own personal set of assumptions that maybe we do have to pay cash for clunkers, which I think we ultimately will wind up doing here. But there's going to be uh, a point at which people uh, spend their own cash for new cars, and that's when the economy recovers. And I think it's a pretty good bet that uh, people will not like riding around in clunkers if uh, they've got the cash back in their pockets, and I think that's a good planning premise. Uh, Mr. Friedman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I said in my testimony, and I will reinforce today, I think that there are good reasons to try to help the auto industry through these difficult times, to invest in the auto industry to help them get through these difficult times. Anytime you invest in technology, you create more jobs. And if we invest in the auto industry tied to performance standards, anytime I, the federal taxpayers put out money, they should expect something in return, so there should be performance standards tied to those investments. If we make those investments, I do think the auto industry can make significant changes. In fact, we're already seeing it. Um, this is an article from Business Week. Detroit finds green in recycled fuel economy ideas. It's about how Ford once nixed fuel economy saving, fuel saving tricks from the 50s and is now using them to boost mileage and cut emissions. The auto industry has the technology. The engineers and, and uh, auto workers are incredibly talented. If you give them the chance, if you make the investment in them, if you trust them uh, to help cut our emissions and make us less dependent on oil, they will deliver. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. Let me ask you. Uh, uh, I just had one point on Mr. that, uh, Mr. Chairman. As you and I have had long discussions and conversations about this, uh, four dollar gas, four dollar gasoline did more to move consumers to fuel efficient vehicles and choices than any regulation, any edict, any government action. And if prices do recover, and just one of the point, your your numbers are accurate uh, on production levels. We've dropped from a high of 17 million vehicles to below 10 million vehicles currently annualized uh, sale. 
assuming a V-shaped recovery, and that's an optimistic uh, assumption, you're looking at 2014-2015 uh, minimum to get back to those kinds of levels. We would welcome 12 and 13 million uh, unit sales uh, at, at this point. But the, the important thing is, even with this downturn, uh, this industry continues to invest more than any other industry in those technologies, in research and development. Thank you, Mr. McCurdy. And let me ask you, uh, Mr. Bowles, one final question, and that is to relate to us the lesson, if you can succinctly, that the regional greenhouse gas initiative that Massachusetts and nine other states are part of that has a kind of a, an equivalent system out in California, the West Coast, and that other states are looking at. What can we learn from what happened in terms of having uh, a system in place that uh, creates new incentives for reducing the amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted into the atmosphere? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the, for the question. And really on behalf of the 10 Reggie states, I, um, I think we can report remarkable success. We learned from the experience of the European Union and the windfall profits that were given to power generators when they were given on an allocation basis their permits and then held them in reserve and ultimately sold them later at a greater price and ended up making money off the permits when the point was to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In Massachusetts, we've adopted a 100 percent auction policy. We've been through three auctions in the nation's first uh, functioning cap and trade program. The price of the auctions have gone up modestly at each point from about $3 a permit to about $3.50 a permit. In Massachusetts, we've raised $43 million that we're plowing back into energy efficiency. Uh, we're seeing jobs being created by that, people saving money uh, on their electric bills uh, from those investments. So I think what we've taken from it is that a auction system uh, works. It works brilliantly. Uh, we haven't had uh, big surprises. We've generated resources back for uh, economically uh, efficient returns that are uh, protecting the environment and, and creating jobs at the same time. So and, and can you give us some sense of what the response is in those 10 states to this system that uh, right now is limited to the utility sector? Yeah, very well. I mean, in Massachusetts, we are we're spending about $150 million a year on energy efficiency anyway as a baseline. We're adding significant new resources and expanding those programs. So I would say it's been uh, very well received in Massachusetts and I think across the uh, footprint of the 10 Reggie states. Okay, great. Um, here's what I'm going to ask each one of you to give us your 30-second summary as uh, we move forward in terms of what you want this committee to remember uh, as we move forward over the next month on uh, passing uh, a climate change and energy bill out of this uh, committee. Um, we will uh, go in reverse order and we will give you, Mr. Delasky, the, uh, the first uh, uh, shot. Um, I'll just reiterate that our support for the subtitle concerning um, appliance standards and urge you to keep that subtitle strong and to maintain the reforms to enable the Department of Energy to set um, standards um, stronger as they move forward to get their program back on track. Thank you very much. Mr. Drebna. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> if I could sum it up in 30 seconds or less, I would, I would, I would urge the committee and the Congress to make sure we know all the consequences, intended and unintended, that as we, as we forge on, uh, as you forge on with the, uh, the legislation, uh, it's just too important and is just not enough. And, and again, from my transport, from the transportation sector, I think, I think we should sit down again and talk about the transportation sector and talk about what is in, in the discussion draft and where we have some, some concerns and where we have some, some other ideas for you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Drebner, very much. Uh, Mr. Gensner. Uh, the, uh, the stimulus package was a good start, a great start on energy efficiency funding, things you've been fighting for for 35 years. The retrofit for energy and environmental performance program and the other elements of the efficiency uh, part of this bill should definitely go forward. And it's also time to move forward aggressively on building codes, both at the residential and the commercial level. Okay, thank you, Mr. Genzer. Uh, Mr. Gardner. Uh, 
the energy efficiency resource standard that's contained in the discussion draft is a great deal for consumers. It's going to save them $100 billion, $170 billion. Uh, it is also a critical, coupled with a renewable electricity standard, it's a critical cost containment strategy that will yield the lowest carbon reduction, cost carbon reductions as we go forward to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Great. Thank you. Mr. Friedman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the key to addressing transportation is looking at it as a system, addressing vehicles, fuels, and a smarter transportation infrastructure and more investment in transit. This bill deserves to pass because it addresses all of these issues. It requires leadership from the administration on top of that, but it sets us down the right path. The, the thing that we have to do is prepare for a future. And if we look back at $4 ga gallon gasoline, one of the things that that did is it started moving consumers away from car companies that weren't ready and to the car companies that were ready with the best technology. We can't afford for that to happen again. We need to make sure they all have the best technology. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. Mr. Ruther. UAW believes the discussion draft has many excellent provisions. We look forward to working with you and, and the entire subcommittee to uh, refine the vehicle efficiency standards to provide a longer term certainty both on the fuel economy, environmental benefits, and certainty to the companies on the directions they need to go with the technology, uh, and we look forward to working with you to make sure that the resources are there so that the companies can do that. Thank you, Mr. Ruther. Uh, Mr. McCurdy. Mr. Chairman, uh, I said earlier, automakers are committed to reducing uh, CO2 from the vehicles that we sell and the uh, plants where we manufacture them. Uh, we want to work, we think that the discussion draft uh, provides a platform for discussion. We share some of the concerns uh, as indicated by Mr. Ruther and believe that we can work to, uh, to improve those. Thank Appreciate you. It. And Mr. Bowles. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you again for this hearing today and the opportunity. Uh, three points to recall. Uh, one is please keep the strong federal-state partnership found in the draft. It builds on mechanisms that work uh, and accelerates them, not replacing them. Second, with due respect, we urge you to get on with it. Congressional leadership on clean energy and climate change is long overdue. You have personally been a tremendous advocate. Uh, the movement through this body is vitally important. Uh, and third, the promise of the clean energy economy is real. It's happening in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Mr. Bowles, very much. And by the way, I just would like to say that any three of you would be a fantastic panel alone <laughs> on an, at an ordinary time. And, uh, and I appreciate you know, your understanding that uh, time is of the essence. Uh, this is the year. Uh, Copenhagen is in December. We have to move uh, and we have to have these issues. And you are right, we're getting it on, uh, Mr. Bowles. You saw that today with the Vice President and Speaker Gingrich. Okay, we are in the middle of an historic debate in this committee. We thank you all very much for your participation. Uh, while this uh, committee, while this uh, panel uh, leaves and the next one assembles uh, before, behind their names. We'll take a two-minute break.